Hands up who here has felt pain before. All right, I want you to keep your hand up if that pain has lasted for, say, a couple of days. A couple of weeks, months, years, maybe. <laughs> okay, now put your hand up if maybe you've been sitting here for a little while, we've been here a, a bit this morning, and you feel like you might need to maybe fidget about, wiggle about in your seat, move around a bit. Something cool is going to happen to a few of you. A few of you who haven't felt like you need to wiggle and move around, because I've brought it to your attention, you're now going to feel the need to. I'm going to do my best to explain this and explain this in the context of movement and exercise. So before we get into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about how pain works. I'm only going to just introduce these concepts because there's been some really, really cool TED Talks that go into a lot of depth about the neuroscience behind pain. So first of all, we'll chat a little bit about pain. So pain is an output, not an input. So what do I mean by that? I mean that, OK, so hands up who here has stubbed their toe on like a table leg? I'm going to get you guys to put your hands up a lot, by the way. So it hurts, right? So what's happening there? So we stub our toe on the table leg. We get a mechanical input. Nerve fibers called nociceptors send a message to our spinal cord which sends a message up to our brain, which interprets this message, places it in context, and determines the necessary outcome, in this case being pain, because it hurts, yeah? Now, as you've probably put together, this happens pretty quick. It's not that we kick our toe and then we go, all right, hang on, yep, kick me toe. All right, what do I do about that? Yeah, nah, pain, should hurt, yep, right here. Our brain does it for us, happens really quickly, and our brain is protecting us, pain is protective. Okay, so this is a body's protective mechanism. So, hands up if anyone here has had back pain. So I'm going to chat a little bit about back pain because it's pretty common and it does happen to be my research area. So let's use an example of how someone might initially get some back pain. Let's say you lift something a bit heavy. Let's say, same as we talked about, mechanical input, on those nociceptors around the back. And that registers and you get some pain. Now what I'm going to do is try and explain why pain might go through some different mechanisms and stick around for a little bit longer than it seems like it should. So we bend over, we pick something up, a bit too heavy, we get a little bit of pain, we go, oh yeah, lifted that a bit wrong, I'll be more careful, or maybe it was a bit too heavy, or so on and so forth, we get it into our day. That's scenario one. Scenario two, Let's say you've got this preconceived idea that backs are really weak, they're really frail, they're vulnerable, and one day they're just going to go on us. So you've got these ideas, right? And our brain is what's making the decision for us on the outcome of what we do. Our brain knows what we think, yeah, because we think with our brain. So if we've got these preconceived ideas and we lift something, our brain's potentially likely to go, oh, no, nah, that's it, today's the day, I've done my back, and then we go on. So another example, another way to think about this, think back to stubbing your toe. Let's say the first time you stub your toe, you're in bed for two weeks. You can't go to school, can't go to work, you get really stressed, it's just all around horrible experience. And then you stub your toe again. And immediately you go down the rabbit hole of, ah, oh, not again. I can't go through this again. This has enough context to increase the painful experience. Something also really cool is going to happen because thoughts and emotions do also play a role in the pain experience. It can play a role in how much pain we feel. It can play a role in how long pain stays around for. So two quick examples on that. Same big toe example. Who here now can actually feel their big toe? Yeah, a few of you. You guys are now probably wondering, can you usually feel your big toe? Same as like what I said before with people who might need to wiggle around that didn't before I asked the question. I didn't change anything about how long you were sitting, how long you've been sitting there. I just brought it to your attention. So pain can happen in a few ways, and like we kind of talked about with the mechanical stimulus of the table, one big thing to remember, and I'm going to talk about this a bit, is pain doesn't have to occur with actual damage. It can just occur with potential damage. So in that scenario, our body's gone, or our brain, sorry, has gone, oh, there's a potential for damage there. Pain is a protective message, as I said. So pain can happen through a lot of ways. 
So one example before I get into talking about exercise that makes you guys might help you guys realize that pain's a little bit more complicated than just how much damage there is. I've worked with quite a few people in the gym that can squat up near and over 200 kilos. Pretty, pretty heavy, pretty impressive. But they'll have back pain when they hop off the couch or do something in their everyday life. Now, a lot of people might tell you that these people need to work on their core strength or core stability, but in my experience, someone who can lift that amount of weight pretty well, they're, they're doing pretty okay in the strength department. So as I said, pain is a little bit more complicated than just how much damage there is. So what does this mean for me as an exercise practitioner? So what I'm going to do is explain to you guys a little bit how this understanding has helped me when I'm working with people in pain and also when I'm working with athletes and people who are coming to me for a performance that aren't necessarily in pain. So one of the first things I do when I'm working with someone in pain is I get them to understand these exact messages I'm telling you here today. I get them to understand how pain works. I get them to understand the messages that pain is trying to tell them. This is empowering and it allows them to understand that their body is just working to protect them. It allows them to build a bigger, better picture. Now, an example to understand how this all ties together. So, it's, a, it's an analogy that I can definitely relate to, and I think a few of you guys might be able to too, is that of a concerned parent, right? So let's say you're, uh, you're learning to drive. You've just got your P plates. Your parent is really, really happy for you, but they're also pretty concerned. Now let's say, unfortunately, they see you driving and you're driving a little bit recklessly. So your parent decides to put a few restrictions on you. You're not allowed to drive in the radio, uh, with the radio on, and say, you're not allowed to drive without your parent in the car with you. Right, so it's their way of putting some restrictions on you. This is kind of what the brain does with pain. So one example without getting too in-depth is, like I said, those fibers that register the mechanical stimulus and send it to our spinal cord in our brain, those fibers, those nociceptors, and the, one in the, area, the ones in the areas around them, will lower their threshold. So it's kind of like they're on alert. alert. So this is kind of like how a, a parent would put restrictions on you. And so by teaching patients these messages, it allows them to understand what's going on and allows them to, to try and move forward. It's kind of like earning the trust back from your parent is how I look about it. Because it's not really too cool to always have your parents sitting in the car with you while you're driving, right? So even though sometimes it might feel like it's working against you, just like it might feel your parents are working against you, they always do know what's best for you. Most of the time, but just don't tell my mom I said that. So this is the first thing I do with people. Now, as I said, my background is exercise, and I work with a few athletes as a strength coach. So how does this stuff help me when I'm working with people in a gym setting that might not necessarily be coming to me for pain, but more for performance or, or just physical activity? All right, hands up who has felt a bit sore after exercise before. Maybe a hard PE class, a run, yep, pretty much everyone. I'm still yet to meet someone that doesn't say yes to that. So this is the same stuff. These are the same mechanisms that are working. It might be through some different processes in terms of how this is registering. It's the same mechanisms. So let's say I have uh, a weightlifter who's routinely squatting around 80% of their maximum. And let's say I'm getting them to do a set of six reps. The first five reps look, look very well. They, they squat exactly how they have to. Everything's perfect. On the sixth rep, a little bit of fatigue, their squat changes slightly. The mechanics of the lift change slightly. Now, what's happening here is there is a redistribution of force. So force is coming through the big muscles we want to be loading, and the supportive muscles are, are helping out too. Pretty much everything's working. But force is kind of working on a spectrum. The large amount of force is going to the right areas. When these mechanics change, more force will get registered to other areas, potentially some smaller muscles in our back. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't squat wrong ever, because if we were to do it body weight, it wouldn't hurt. But if we were to do it with a significant enough weight on our back, then those tissues may not have the capacity to tolerate that load. So this is, is a pretty common scenario, and this is where understanding these messages has, has definitely helped me as a practitioner. Another pretty common one is hands up if you play a contact sport like rugby, rugby league, something like that. 
So if I have someone who plays rugby league that I'm working with, there's a lot of mechanical stimulus, right? Because this is what's happening when another player is trying to tackle you or you're trying to tackle another player. There's a collision, it's mechanical stimulus. So I can pretty much guarantee that if they've got a game on Sunday, they come into the gym Monday, they're going to have a few sore or tender spots. So this is where understanding these, these concepts and pain physiology has helped me in a gym setting, even working with people that aren't in pain. So I'll use those two examples. With the first person who was able to squat for five reps and then the sixth rep, they uh, changed their technique slightly and you know, registered a mechanical input, felt a bit of pain. It tells me a couple of things. It tells me, well, pretty obviously, that they can do that weight for five, but maybe not six. It tells me that if the next set is going to go ahead, something potentially has to change. We might need to increase some rest time, so we reduce some fatigue. We might need to reduce the amount of reps, reduce the load, something along those lines. For the contact sport athlete, for the rugby league player, it tells me that these tissues, they're not necessarily damaged, but the body is feeling a reason it needs to protect them. So it tells me what tissues that the body is protecting. It tells me if they come in the door and tell me they're a bit sore here or there, I might have to alter the program for the day so we don't exacerbate that. We don't throw something more at that concerned parent which is saying, hey, chill out a bit. It tells me we might have to change a few things. We might have to get someone else in, another practitioner who can help with some, some other stuff that I don't necessarily do. So this is where understanding one thing, which when I started to learn this stuff, I didn't realize how it would translate to different settings. But it has made me able to, to understand and improve my work in multiple areas of life. All pain has a message behind it. All pain is trying to tell you something. Pain is protective, and pain is a good thing. I want to challenge all of you guys to try and start building a clearer picture about what your pain is trying to tell you. What are the messages behind it? And just always remember that pain is protecting us and pain is a good thing. Thank you very much.